Excellent. Welcome to technical session number 18. Where we're going to be getting into introduction to networking. We're going to be talking about some various network topologies or examples of different types of networks. We're going to be talking about some of the devices that are used in common networks as well. We're going to be getting into some more cables and connectors. I know you all have missed those over the last week, so we brought more for you. And we're going to be able to recognize some of the most common network tools. For many of these, it'll be a review, but it's always good to go over them again and talk about them a little bit more in context. So for this particular technical session, we want to maintain a behavior skill of adaptability, understanding that, especially in IT, things are always changing, shifting, moving, developing. Uh, And uh, we have to be able to change and adjust with it. We cannot control the wind, but we can adjust our sails, so to speak. And then growth mindset. All of you have been doing a wonderful job of this so far. We just got to keep it up. We understand our intelligence is not fixed. We can develop new skills. We can train ourselves to do new things. All right, so in general, what is a network? So a network links computers together for communication, sharing of information and resources. This could be as little as two computers or as many as thousands. And all of them have kind of different types of networks and how they communicate. And we use what are called physical and logical um, network topologies. A network in general must provide connections because we can't communicate without that, right? Uh, a format in which we are going to communicate and various services to kind of give us a reason to communicate. Types of network components that we will be kind of talking about over the next week or so. Uh, the client, this is any device that is needing access or using the access to the network to gain resources or information. So this could be a laptop or a computer, whatever you're on right now, and that is a client. Um, it could be a PC, it could be a smartphone, it could be a tablet, it could be a printer. And at any given time, your computer may be a client in one respect or a server or host in another. A server is a device that serves up resources to the network. So some examples would be like a web service server, email server, file server, proxy server. All of these serve very specific functions. Thankfully, they name them pretty easily. So it's kind of you know simple to figure out what they do. Um, other than this, we have network devices, which are essentially what help enable or create that network for us. Um, some examples of this are switches, routers, access points, bridges, hubs, which typically aren't used much anymore. Um, but all of these enable the connections that we use to create these ever expanding networks. And then the media. What is the method in which we are transmitting that data? That could be copper wire, like coaxial or twisted pair. It could be fiber optic utilizing light to send information, or it could be Wi-Fi using radio waves to send it over the air. Basic topologies. Topologies is basically just another fancy way of saying layout. We have a few here that we need to work with. We won't necessarily go in order. Uh, we'll start with the first and simplest, which is the bus. So bus is one of the oldest types of networks. It is used today kind of in network segments, but not as a actual network setup for the most part. So in a bus, you would have a series of computers 
linked to a single line of communication. Old school networks, they would use coaxial cable for this. And um, <clears throat> even today, when we're adding a new port for you to hook up, we call it a drop. And back then what it was is they would have a coaxial cable kind of running through the drop ceiling. And then they would go up there with this little clip that had a spike on it and they would drive the spike down into the coaxial cable so that it made contact with the copper wire. And then they would literally just drop a box down uh, to your desk where you would use a BNC connection to hook into the network. So you were literally dropping a line down from the ceiling. Now on ring networks or on, excuse me, on bus networks, they had these little boxes on either end of the lines and they're called terminators. And they do just what they say they do. They're terminating the end of the line, but they also serve another valuable purpose, which is to terminate the signal. Because if we don't terminate the signal, it's gonna reflect back down the line. So if somebody sends a signal, it's just gonna kind of bounce around a little bit and it's gonna take longer. It's gonna slow the network down because I'm not sure if you were aware, but on a network like this and on many networks, only one computer can talk at a time. Everybody else has to wait while one is speaking. This is very true on the bus networks. So they use a technology called CSMA. slash CD. CSMA slash CD, this stands for Carrier Sense Multiple Assurance Collision Detection. <clears throat> and so what it's doing, like we said, only one person can talk at a time, right? What happens if two people speak at the same time? You have what's called a data collision the data becomes almost unreadable because both people are speaking at the same time. So once this feature detects a data collision, each computer will do what's called, they will back off. And then they, you know, they wait for a random time. It's like they roll a dice that has like a million sides on it and it gives them a number and then they wait for a random time. And after that time goes, they speak. So, and since they, it's unlikely that the two computers will have the exact same wait time, one computer can start speaking, they'll sense communication on the line and they'll wait. Once the communication is done, they'll speak again. It seems like this is an extremely inefficient way to communicate and you would be correct in thinking that. So again, the bus is still used today, but it's more in network segments rather than the base network itself but we'll talk about that as we kind of move along. Um, the other thing with the ring network, excuse me, is if the line breaks anywhere, the whole network is down. So it doesn't have much redundancy. You have one break in the line and that's it. So that's the, the weakness of the bus. Next, I have better pictures of these in a little in a minute for you. Uh, we got the ring. And what the ring does is it connects each computer to the one next to it. Forming a ring. So if I'm in computer, you know, one, and I want to speak to computer four, 
I got to send that message through two, three, and then get to four. So it's more of a closed loop. It can uh, transmit a little bit faster. CSMA slash CD is still in effect because only one person can communicate at a time. Otherwise, there is a data collision. Same problem here. If I lose a computer or a line, the network is down. This is also an older one, but still used in uh, storage as a network or SANS, uh, which they would use high speed um, fiber optics in a token ring to create uh, this as a segment, but it's not widely used in open networks. Any questions with the ring? Again, an older network. Okay. <laughs> that was a good question. I know, right? <laughs> I was about to say that sounded like a ring network. <laughs> right? Dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig -a. Um, okay, so after the ring, I'm going to jump around a little bit. I'm going to go to the mesh network first. And the mesh network connects every computer to every other computer. So every computer is connected to every other computer in the network. Upside of this, if I lose a line and five needs to talk to four, five can send the communication to three, then back to four. It's very hard to bring down a mesh network because everybody's connected to everybody, right? So there's different pathways we can use to communicate if any breaks in the network. And if a, and if a computer goes down, like if five goes down, as long as I'm not needing the resources on five, the network is still up because four is still connected to one, two, and three. So no individual piece can bring down the network. So that is a huge bonus. Downside, these are a nightmare to manage. And they're more expensive, a lot more expensive. I'm gonna show you why. There's a formula for calculating how many wires you're gonna to need to set up a mesh network. And that's N times N minus one divided by and that will tell you exactly how many cables you need to set up a mesh network, depending on how many computers you have. N is the number of computers. So if I have five computers, how many cables do I need? Ten. Right? Nice, Simon. You have ten. So I have five computers, I need 10. So say we're doing really good. We now have eight employees. How many cables do I need for eight? Four. It's eight times seven. Kelly, could you repeat what N represents? You said the computer, right? N represents the number of computers. Number of computers, thank you. Mm -hmm. So eight times seven is 56 divided by two. 28. So do we see a problem here? I've added three 
computers and I've almost tripled the number of connections I need. So the amount of connections you need grows exponentially with almost every addition to the network. So mesh networks, great in theory, hard to maintain. The only ways they're typically maintained, we do utilize them with regards to uh, the internet is essentially an example of a giant mesh network. Um, but for the most part, from an enterprise level, if we're going to maintain one like this, it's typically wireless mesh. So it's a lot easier to maintain because there's no physical cabling. Physical cabling wise, it becomes unwieldy very quickly. So very robust, complex to maintain, and expensive, gets expensive really quickly. And as this is set up, CSMA still in effect. All right, questions on the mesh? Experts on the mesh. Normally used. You what? So the mesh network, where normally it's used. Normally, like I said, normally it's used in a wireless sense, so wireless mesh. Cameras, can it be used for cameras? Um, again, you would use it in, yeah, like cameras would go, would, I'll get into the more common use, that would make sense. But um, a wireless mesh, like if you have a big Wi-Fi network, that would be type of a wireless mesh. You could set it up that way. Wired wise, it's very rarely used because of its complexity and difficulty of maintaining. What is most commonly used is the star. So you would have a central device, which would be a hub or a switch, and that connects to all of the other devices. It's one of the easiest to set up and most commonly used today. Even most wireless networks aren't really wireless mesh, they are a wireless star because all communication would have to go through the central device. So you'd have a hub or a switch in the middle, and then this would allow all devices to kind of communicate. <clears throat> Only problem is if the central device goes down, the entire network is, is down. So there's a central point of failure. So that is the, the problem with it. But again, it's very easy to establish get up and running, all that kind of fun stuff. And most networks look like this today. Questions on the star? Kind of looks like a star, so makes sense, right? Lastly, we have a hybrid. All a hybrid is, is a combination of these others. The most common hybrid network you see is called a star bus. So what they have is, so say you have an office building and you have five floors, you would probably set up a star network on every single floor and then use a bus to connect all the floors together. So the bus would run vertically between the floors and you'd have a star on each floor. Does that make sense? And that would be technically a hybrid network. Am I making it worse or are we okay? Wait, can you explain that one more time, sorry? 
All right. So we have the star. So say I have, we'll just do two built two floors right here to kind of make the point. So four one and floor two. And then I would use a bus network to connect floor one and floor two together. Does that make sense? So I have a star network on, floor, on the first floor, star network on the second floor, and then I would use a bus segment to connect the two floors together. Okay. And this would be a bus network? This would be a hybrid network of bus, star bus. So star and a bus network together. Okay. So a hybrid is a combination of these networks together. Kind of like the hybrid hard drive is a combination between a solid state and a mechanical. This would be the same thing for a hybrid. I do have better pictures on the next page. So in this example, if the bus the line drops so the uh, buildings network like inside individual they can work right yeah so you'd have like you'd have like a, a switch on the first floor connecting 30 computers together and you'd have a switch in the second floor connecting 30 computers together and a switch on the third floor connecting 30 computers together and then you'd run a bus between the first floor switch the second floor switch and the third floor switch so those three floors could talk to each other so you have star networks and then you connect them with a bus. But what if the bus line breaks? How will the first floor connect with the third floor? Well, if the bus line breaks, then the floors couldn't communicate with each other, but they could communicate amongst themselves. Okay. So the bus segment would break down, but they could communicate amongst themselves. Like the first floor could still communicate with anybody in the first floor. They just couldn't communicate with the second floor. Right. So that segment would break down. And here's some pictures that are a little bit better than mine that kind of explain the topologies a little bit. We got our mesh network here where everything's connected to everything else. <clears throat> our common bus, our ring technology, and then our star network. Any questions on this? Good screen to take a screenshot of just to kind of memorize the uh, apologies a little better. All right, moving along. Types of network by resource location, client or server. <clears throat> client server network is one that contains both clients and servers. Okay, not all networks do this. Some are what are called peer to peer where I have some resources and I share them with Justin. And Justin has some that I wanna use. And then maybe Jutoria has some resources that we want to use as well. So we have a connection between the three of us. There is no centralized device that would store the uh, resources that we all need. So in a peer-to-peer, -peer, sometimes you're the server, sometimes you're the client. 
client server network here, you tend to have centralized devices that you all communicate with to have it serve up resources to you. All right, peer to peer, like we were just talking about, all clients, no servers. <clears throat> and you all kind of share the network burden. Works well for small networks, very small networks. Um, if you get, they say you can have up to 20, but generally above 10, it becomes very hard to manage and your networks become extremely slow. Here's a problem with peer-to-peer. -peer. I would need to have a sign-in and password for every computer if I'm working on it. So if I needed to get resources from Tutorial's computer, I would need to have a sign-in and password to be able to access it. So from an IT perspective, if I have 10 people and we reset our passwords every three months, every three months, I have to reset 100 passwords. That's 10 people with 10 passwords each just for this small network. So it becomes very, very difficult to manage from an IT perspective. And then again, from a networking perspective above 10, it becomes very hard to manage <clears throat> and the networks become extremely slow. All right, so we have our client server, we have our peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, let's talk about geographic types of networks. We talked about topologies, which gave us our, our local types that we could create. Now we have to talk about geographic network styles. Smallest one is called a PAN. Stands for personal area network. And the easiest way to think about this is just with arms within arm's reach. Primary communication method for this is Bluetooth. But they also have some wired versions like Firewire, USB, among others. Most commonly nowadays is Bluetooth. Um, but this is all organized around generally a single person. So that's why they call it a PAN. It's a personal network. It's a network for you. You can link two computers together if you're transferring files. You can, search, you can sync your phone to your computer. You can have a headset, smartphone, PDA, printers, mice, keyboards, all that kind of fun stuff attached to this individualized network. It is extremely flexible, and we all tend to have them around us every day. This is the smallest form of network that you can use called the PAN. Let's step it out of it. For the LAN, for the local area network. So this is essentially a collection of computers, relatively small area, typically confined to an office or a single building. All the devices are connected by a common medium, be that Wi-Fi, um, fiber, which would be really expensive, coaxial or twisted pair, which is the most common. Um, it allows for the sharing of data, peripherals, all that kind of fun stuff. You can have store, you can have servers attached. Um, the topologies that we were just discussing before, the bus, the star, the ring, mesh, all that can be done in LAN protocols. And the nice thing about it is it's high speed at a low cost. All right. And do we have CSMA collision in this or no? Sometimes. Uh, we're going to get into, we start talking about the different devices. It depends on the device you're using because we have to get into what are called broadcast domains and collision domains. So those are two very, those are two different things. Uh, but we'll talk about those here very shortly when we talk about the different types of devices we use. So, but 
Excellent question, Majid. But we will we'll come back to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So on a land, sometimes uh, CSMA CD is in effect. Sometimes it's not. But we will talk about that. All computers have it built in, but sometimes it's relevant. Sometimes it's really not. All right, let's expand it out a little bit. So we have wireless LAN. So this is very similar to the actual LAN, uh, but its connections are all via radio signals or wireless. So it's a WLAN, wireless LAN. It can be public and unsecure or private and secure depending on how you set it up. Now, we talked about CSMA CD on a wireless network, they use something a little different. It's called C, S, M, I promise you my, my drawing only gets worse. CSMA, C, A. So we had C, D, which was collision detection. On a wireless standard, it is called C, A, which is collision avoidance. Much like on a wired LAN, on a wireless LAN, on a wireless LAN, only one person can talk at a time again. So what they're going to do is the device is going to listen and see if anybody's communicating. And if nobody's communicating, then it will talk. So it's actively trying to avoid data collisions. So that's the CSMA CA or collision avoidance. And that is specifically for wireless. So CD, collision detection, is wired. CA is collision avoidance, and it's wireless. Any questions on this? All right. So wireless uh, networks are awesome because they provide a lot of flexibility, mobility, all that kind of fun stuff. You're not anchored to a particular spot. You can get up move around. If you have a laptop, you can, you know, go sit in the lobby for a while, sit in the break room, sit at your desk. Some offices don't actually have assigned desks. They just have varieties of working areas that you can, you can work in. Um, and then the wireless LAN can actually create a lot of flexibility in that sense. All right. One second here, George. There you go. All right, so wireless LAN. Now, let's step it out a bit. Wireless mesh network. So, when you have a typical WLAN, you have a single access point or a WAP, which is a wireless access point, WAP, WAP. So with a wireless net, wireless LAN, you have a single WAP or access point for the wireless to communicate and connect to the network. If you have a much larger area, other than say like a single office or something like that, uh, maybe it's a entire building, like a hospital or something like that. You can't just have a single wireless antenna run the whole thing, right? So you have to use a series of wireless access points connected together in the network. And they set these up so they all basically have the exact same sign-in and password. So as I'm walking through a office building, many of you may have experienced this, you see the little domes sticking out of the ceiling that are the wireless, the Wi-Fi antennas. So as I'm walking through the building, 
I'm dropping connections from one Wi-Fi, connecting to the other, and it seems to happen seamlessly because as I'm searching for it, they all basically have the same network name and password. And what happens is, is they have the uh, master device, and then you have all the other devices that kind of follow it. Because if I need to change the wireless network name and password, it's very inefficient for me to go around and change it for every single individual device, right? So typically you would have a master device where I can upload a new SSID to that device and passphrase or password, and it pushes it out to all the other devices. So you have a controller device. And that's kind of how it works. So as I'm moving through, because they all have the same network name and password, I drop one as a signal gets weaker, I connect to another as a signal gets stronger. And it creates a seamless wireless mesh, so to speak, network. Some of us may have something similar to this in our house. Uh, if you have Comcast, they have these little pods that you can plug in to expand your net, your networks. I think EO is another company that has like wireless mesh uh, devices that you can use to set up if you have uh, multiple rooms or um, if you happen to be in a building with concrete walls, it's hard to get signals through there. So you can use these mesh devices to kind of communicate. Questions on this? All right. Open it up a little bit. So now we have a MAN or a Metropolitan Area Network. So this can be from a couple city blocks or a few buildings. So like a college campus, although they actually have a term for it's called a CAN, which is a campus area network, but they don't utilize it in A+, they use it in Network+. Plus. So you have a MAN, which is a few buildings up to an entire metro area. So, and what this is doing is it's connecting multiple lands together. So like here in Jacksonville, we have FSCJ, which is Florida State College of Jacksonville. And they have like five campuses around town or something like that. All of these are connected through a man. So it's multiple lands connected through a man. Does this make sense? So metropolitan area, metro area network, limits are about the size of a city. Expand it even further. So we get a little bit further out, we call it a WAN or a wide area network. This goes beyond a single city. This can be across a continent or across multiple continents. So if you have a giant company that is connected all over the globe, they would use a WAN. And this could be the connection of multiple LANs or MANs together to create a giant network. Biggest example of this is the internet. So smallest, you got the pan, then you get the LAN, then you get the MAN, and then the WAN. And then in there, you have your wireless versions, which is the WLAN and the WMAN. You good on this? Do we need to pause for like a few minutes? Marinate? So we talked about physical topologies. We talked about geographic network types. Now we can get into some of the network devices. We briefly mentioned before the NIC or the network interface card. And its primary purpose is to provide a physical connection between the computer and your network cable, essentially, just facilitating that communication. 
Um, it can boost the digital signal from the computer, change the data stream from a wide stream to a narrow stream, parallel to serial conversion, and moves data to and from random access memory, and it manages the flow from, you know, to and from the network itself. And depending on the speed of the data coming in, it can buffer that network so that the computer can handle it and be able to process that information. And that is your network interface card. It can be wired or wireless. Many computers have more than one NIC in it. Each NIC has its own sort of social security number. And that is called the MAC address or media access control. It is a unique address to each NIC and it is a 48 bit expression that is shown in 12 hexadecimal characters. What is a hexadecimal? Glad you asked. Um, so we know or we've seen in an IP address where it's four series of numbers, right? And we can use eight bits to represent a number anywhere from zero to 255. Remember doing that in uh, Coursera, right? Well, hexadecimal breaks it down into nibbles and we use a nibble, which is four bits, to create a hexadecimal number anywhere between, it's actually a decimal anywhere between zero and 15. But as we cannot represent two digit numbers with a single character, we use letters. So once we hit 10, we jump over to A, B, C, D, E, and F. So any hexadecimal number, if you see a letter higher than F, it is invalid. So anytime you see that, it is not a valid number. It should be discarded. Here is the binary representation. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on and so on and so on, counting up to 15. <clears throat> in theory, no two um, NIC cards in the world have the same MAC address. I say in theory because it is actually relatively easy to spoof a MAC address or pretend to have the same MAC address as somebody else. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But with regards to the MAC address, it is broken up into two chunks. You have the first three right here, which identify the manufacturer of the NIC card. So if it was like Toshiba or something like that, the, the first three pairs identify the manufacturer. Second three pairs identify that unique MAC address from the manufacturer. This is also known as your hardware address, physical address, adapter address, or ethernet address. So all of those are synonyms essentially for the same thing. So on Wi-Fi networks and other networks, you can use something called MAC filtering to determine whether or not a computer can, can communicate on your network. So say I only have five network devices. I only want those five network devices to communicate. I can create what's called a MAC filter and I would put in the MAC address, this address here, for all five of my devices. And then no other device can communicate on the network. One thing I can do if I, am, <clears throat> if I am a unsavory person is I can spin up a virtual machine. And in that virtual machine, I can create a NIC card for my virtual computer. And then in there, I can actually just type in what MAC address I wish to use. So I can essentially spoof a MAC address to bypass MAC filtering. So for the purposes of the A+, they consider MAC filtering a security feature. In real life, it really is not. 
So long-winded way of saying that. So for the purposes of the exam, this is considered a security feature, but with regards to real life, it is very easily bypassed. So it is not really a security feature. Kelly, <clears throat> when you're identifying the, the, the bytes, uh, that would be the characters um, before the colon? Yeah, these right here. Yeah. So, um, so for this particular MAC address, let's go ahead and write it out here. Um, ba, 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 let's go to the text. Expand it out. So let's go ahead and write out the binary for that particular this particular MAC address. So I have an E, which I if I look over here at my fun little chart here, my binary for E would be one 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 zero. So. Can y'all see the 1110 or only when I? Yeah, we see it. Okay. Uh, next, I have zero, which if we look at our MAC or our binary chart right there, it's a 0000. So 0000. Colon. My next would be C. I go over to my handy dandy chart, it's 1100. B, which is 1011. Colon. My next would be four, which is zero one zero zero. And then E, which we already did is one 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 zero colon nine, which is one zero zero one. Three, which is zero zero one one colon zero, which is zero 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 two, which is zero zero one zero. And then lastly, seven, which is zero one 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 and eight, which is da, 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 one zero zero zero. So this is what the computer sees. That's a little bit of a pain for us to read, right? So rather than use this, it spits these letters out. So it looks like this it is a much easier read for us. And that is why they're converting over to hexadecimal for IP addresses and stuff like that. But we will talk about that tomorrow. So does the hexadecimal thing make sense? Yes. We're all cool on it. We take screenshots of this so that we, you know, we can put it under our pillow and memorize it through osmosis. All right, we're all experts on it. Awesome, let's play Flippy Bit. Cool, so Flippy Bit is a game kind of like Galaga, essentially. I'm gonna pull this over here so I can play. Um, let's see if I can find it real quick. And what you do is, at the bottom of your keyboard, you're gonna be given two hexadecimal characters and you have to type in the binary of each character. And you're using the bottom row on your keyboard. So you have ZXCV, that's gonna be your left hand, and that's gonna be your first four bits. And then you have BNM comma, and that'll be your second four bits. And you only press the switches on the ones to turn them on. This make sense? Can you repeat, please? I'm going to go ahead. So now that we talk about MAC addresses and NIC cards and stuff like that, we got to get into other types of network devices that we will see and use on a pretty regular basis. Um, and some of the most common ones that we'll come across, um, there's the on older networks. It's rare to see it, but they do still exist and they do still have uses. Um, though not necessarily in establishing networks and stuff like that. And that'd be the hubs. And then you would have switches, which are what basically replace the hubs for the most part, uh, bridges, routers, and repeaters. And we'll kind of talk about uh, when you would use each of these items and kind of how they communicate. So first, 
is the hub itself. And essentially this is gonna be like a center point on a star network. I'm not sharing my screen. Oh, that's awful. Sharing is caring. There we go, can we see it now? I was wondering why I could see everybody's chat. Wrong yeah. screen, I think. Hmm? It's showing your oh. lessons. Oh. Wrong button. <laughs> so there we go. Right screen, wrong button. All right. So this is what I was kind of showing before. Various devices we're going to be talking about. Switch, bridge, router, repeater, hub. And the first and kind of lowest on the totem pole, this whole thing is the hub. Uh, early star networks, you would utilize a hub to connect multiple computers together so that they could all communicate. The bad part about the hub is it doesn't really do any kind of forwarding decisions or anything like that. If it comes in one port, it shouts your business out to every other port. Hmm. So if I want to communicate with Majid, I'm basically shouting my business out to everybody else. And then what was kind of happening is, is the NIC cards would see that I've addressed the communication to Majid and be like, yep, that's not for me and drop the packet. Problem being, we still have data collisions. So if more than one person talks at a time, causes the data collision, everybody has to back off. You have that carrier sense multiple assurance collision detection has the waiting period before we can communicate again. So hubs could only work on really small networks. The more computers you added to the network, the more data collisions you would have, the slower your communications would go. So there is no particular way it communicates. It just quite literally blasts everything out. So this is still considered what is called a collision domain. So it means collisions are possible. Um, they have wireless models of hubs or called access points or WAPs. And the type, the way it communicates is what's called layer one. So it uses um, binary. So as the binary comes in, it just sends the binary out to every port. So it's a layer one device. So layer one protocols, physical connections, doesn't really make any routing decisions or forwarding decisions. It just sends it out everywhere. Now, Again, this is very slow, cumbersome, a lot of data collisions, not very efficient. So we have to step it up to the switch. Now the switch operates in the same location as a hub would. So we would basically just pull the hub out of a network and put a switch in its place. And it's actually one of the fastest ways to improve a network if they are using hubs. Just replace the hubs with switches and everything works a lot faster. Similar to the hub, except it uses addressing to forward packets. So now if I want to send a message to Majid, it's going to create a direct connection between me and him and not send my information out to everybody else. So it'll create that direct connection and it's going to use our MAC addresses. So that, that social security number, or that identifying number for our network interface card is going to be used to forward that communication. So I would use Majid's MAC address to forward information to him. So this is called a layer two device. Layer two uses MAC addresses to communicate. That's how it makes the forwarding decisions. <clears throat> and we have two main types of switches. We'll get into uh, some of the better aspects of the managed switch a little bit later. We have what's called an unmanaged and a managed switch. So you have ones like this that would be typically used in small offices, maybe in your home, something along those lines has like, you know, four, six, eight, ten 10 connections on it, much smaller. And this is unmanaged. And that basically means you don't really have to do anything. You quite literally just plug it in and it goes. It gets MAC addresses from each port. So it knows who's on what port. When I say I want to send a communication to Majid, it's like, okay, I'm sending a communication to this MAC address. It goes in port one, boom, Magic's on port three, it sends it right out there. 
beautiful part on this. Remember how we said in a hub, it was a collision domain. So all of these computers, when they're talking, their data can collide and cause those data collisions where you have to back off and wait and all that fun stuff. On the switch, each individual port is its own collision domain. So if we just have computers attached to them, the data can't collide because it's creating direct connections for us. So data collisions go away instantly, making the network significantly faster because we don't have all the data collisions. We don't have to wait all that time. More people can talk at the same time. Communications happen at a lot faster pace. And on an unmanaged switch, we plug it in and we walk away. It's a beautiful thing. It does its thing. Now, on an industrial level, you would see a much larger version like this that would be in a rack. And these are typically what are called managed switches. So managed switches, we have a lot more control about what's going on. So say I have a 100 port switch. You know, just for the sake of ease of use. And I have 25 people in HR, 25 people in accounting, 25 people in operations, and 25 people in sales. On the managed switch, I could break out those groups, those 25 ports for HR, those 25 ports for accounting, those 25 ports for operations, and 25 ports for sales. And I could put them on their own LAN or virtual LAN. So I can create a network just for them. And then in order to communicate, like if HR wanted to communicate with accounting, they can't do it off the same switch. They would need to go through a router in order to communicate with each other. So what I'm doing is I'm managing groups and breaking them up into smaller networks using the switch as that medium. Kind of nice, makes things a little bit easier to manage or make sure networks easier to manage. The other nice thing is, is if we're in a small office and say, Germanesh is in accounting and she switches over to HR. I don't have to move her desk. I don't have to do any fancy wiring. I can quite literally go into the switch and move her port from accounting to HR. She never has to move her desk. So I'm able to manage the networks without physically moving people or rewiring the networks. So network management becomes a lot easier. Questions on this? All right, so that's a switch. Layer two device uses MAC addresses to communicate. And each port now is its own collision domain, unlike a hub where all of these computers are on the same collision domain, meaning if they, they talk at the same time, their data can collide. Next, we get to a bridge. Kind of an easy way to think of a bridge. It's, it's just an adapter. It really is all it is. Um, it connects to physically dissimilar networks. So if I'm going from Wi-Fi into a wireless access point that is connected wired to my router, that WAP is a bridge. It is connecting two physically dissimilar networks, Wi-Fi and twisted pair or Ethernet cable. If I'm going from fiber optic, to coaxial, I can't just plug the two ends together, they can't communicate. I have to have a bridge to jump from one to the other or an adapter to change the signal from a fiber optic signal to one that can run over coaxial cable. So that is what a bridge does. When you have physically dissimilar networks, the bridge establishes that connection. Does this make sense? All right, so now we get to a gateway. This is also known as a router. They're kind of the same thing, depending on how they're used. 
And our gateway connects to logically dissimilar networks. So between a LAN and a MAN, or a MAN and a WAN, they're logically dissimilar. Or if we want to connect two different networks together. So if I wanted to connect two star networks together, I would use a router or a gateway. These are typically on the edge of our networks or in between internal networks. So routers or gateways make forwarding decisions. Remember the hub makes no forwarding decision. It's a layer one, everything comes in, it shouts it all out in binary. Layer two, forwarding decisions are made by MAC address. So if I wanna communicate with Majid, I need to know his Nick's MAC address and I can communicate with him. Layer three uses IP addresses to make forwarding decisions. So routers are what are called a layer three device. So layer one is our physical layer. Layer two is our data link. Layer three is our network layer. Probably saw this in the Google Coursera. They probably mentioned this a little bit. So routers, layer three uses IP addresses. So if we're gonna be going out over the internet or communicating between networks, we need IP addresses of the networks we're gonna be communicating with. And that's how the routers work. So they, they sit between subnetworks or they work as gateways between our intranet, our internal network and the internet, which is the outside world, essentially. <clears throat> they can either work as these big industrial ones like you see right here, which would be in server racks in your server room, all the way down to these personal devices. I know this is a really old one um, that you would use in your home. Although the ones in your home, we kind of have a misconception of what a router is because these are kind of like all-in-one devices. They serve multiple purposes other than just being a router. But we will get into that uh, Monday, I believe. So you have two different versions of it, essentially. Questions on hubs, switches, bridges, and routers. All right, they don't really get into it in this um, presentation, but a repeater is a device that kind of what does what's called re-upping a signal. So when you have a twisted pair or a, or a typical ethernet cable, the data can only transmit so far. So when I send the data over the the ethernet cable, so each medium you have will have a different throughput, like how much data it can transmit at one time and how far it can transmit that data. So of your typical ethernet cable, it's about 100 meters or 300 feet. After that, we have what's called attenuation, which basically means the signal starts to break down. It becomes harder and harder to read. Um, or we start having crosstalk on the cables where the, so the signals are kind of jumping from wire to wire. So it's usually only about 100 meters. So if we have to stretch a distance beyond 100 meters, we have to kind of re-strengthen that signal. So we would use something called a repeater. And that would be the network device if we need to extend our network beyond the ranges of a individual cable. Questions on that? It's not a physical device, right? Sorry, what was anyone? It's no, not repeaters a physical... are physical devices. So, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so yeah, you would have them like, um, so like fiber optic cables, some of them can go like 10 kilometers. And now we have fiber optic con cables connecting continents together. So like when we went from here to Europe or from here to Asia or from here to Latin America, we had to use these uh, fiber optic cables across you know, the ocean. The ocean's a lot longer than 10 kilometers, right? So every 10 kilometers, they would have to attach a device that would repeat the signal down the line. So it would reboost that signal and then push it down the line again. And so we would have multiple repeaters along the line to get across the ocean. So yeah, they are physical devices. Although they don't really get into them 
in the A plus too, too much other than knowing what they are, because typically it's a higher level networking engineer that's going to be utilizing or building networks to that scale. All right. So we talked about the router on the edge of our network. How do we protect our networks? Well, one device we can use to kind of protect our network is called a firewall. And this is a network security. It can either be a appliance. So it's an appliance. It can either be a physical device that you would put on the edge of your network, or it can be software on a computer. So you remember I was talking about Windows Defender Firewall? So this is a lighter weight version of the hardware one you would use. So another name for a software-based firewall is a host firewall. And you may use you know, layers of these in your networks because there is, as you will hear say a little repeatedly, there is no real silver bullet with regards to network security. You have to do things in layers. So MAC address may not be a perfect security measure, but you may put it in there just as a extra little layer to be in place because in reality, locks just keep honest people honest. That's about it. Um, so in our firewalls, we have two basic kinds. Obviously, our hardware ones are going to be more robust and you know have more capability capabilities than our software ones. But even within the firewall arena, you have two basic types of firewalls. The ones that you typically see on computers are what are called stateful firewalls. And basically what that means is it's paying attention to the state of the conversation and conversations must start from behind the firewall. So if I have a firewall up and Kurt wants to send me or start talking to me, he can't communicate with me. My firewall is going to block that conversation. So what's gonna to have to happen is, is I have to reach out from beyond the firewall, from behind the firewall, out to Kurt, and then we can have a conversation. So what it's doing is, is preventing unauthorized access from outside. So all communication must begin from behind the firewall. So if I'm reaching out to a web server, I need to reach out and request information from the web server. And then when it sends information back, it will be able to pass back through the firewall. The problem with stateful firewalls is once communication is initiated, it assumes all further communication in that string is consensual. So this is why hyperlinks are dangerous. When they send you an email with a hyperlink, they're trying to get you to communicate past the firewall to invite the information back in. This is how they bypass stateful firewalls because all it's doing is paying attention to the state of the conversation. As long as that communication is open, it assumes we're all good. <clears throat> so it's a good base layer type of security. The other type of security that they have for the firewall is called packet filtering. Now what this is gonna do is it's going to inspect all the data packets that are passing back and forth and see if there's any nefarious material going through. Um, if you're working for a large corporation, they're gonna be seeing if you're sending trade secrets out. Uh, some of them may, uh, may actually react. If you try to encrypt something, it will auto block it if it is not a encryption algorithm that is allowed by the company. So if you try to encrypt something and send it through the firewall, firewall stops it. So it's gonna be inspecting all of these little packets. Much more secure, slows things down quite a bit. So that's the downfall of the packet filtering. It makes things a lot slower. Um, it also can operate off of things that are called access control lists or ACLs. So you have these ACL rules and it's basically what is allowed and what is not allowed. They have different ways of expressing this. So you have, uh, depending on what literature you're reading, you may have a what's called a white list or an allow list. And basically what it is, is if you're on that list, it's allowed. Everything else will be denied. So that is a whitelist or an allow list. 
Anything on there is allowed, everything else is denied. Tends to be really secure, a real pain for IT to maintain. Especially when you're dealing with things like sales and all that kind of fun stuff where they have to kind of um, do research on customers, go to various websites and all that fun stuff. You're gonna spend a lot of your time managing these lists. So that's the, the, uh, the white list. Then you have the black list or deny list. And that's basically you would go in and you would put specific sites that you would wanna be blocked. So this could be like, you know, um, <clears throat> unsavory video download places, LimeWire, um, gambling sites, adult sites, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. You could sit there and put them on this deny list. Um, if you don't want them going to news sites or YouTube or Spotify or any of that kind of fun stuff and chewing up your bandwidth at the office, you can put that kind of stuff on there. And basically anything that is on this list is either blocked and if it's not on that list, it's allowed. So there are two different types of access control lists that you can implement if you wish. Questions on this? Can we apply ACL on stateful firewall or no? Um, basically, you can have ACL aspects, yes, on a stateful firewall, yes. So you can do content filtering. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But typically, packet filtering is where you're going to see it. So that's firewalls. We'll talk more about firewalls as we go through, but that's just kind of an introduction to it. All right. Cables and connectors. I know you all missed it. We brought them back. So we're talking about our coaxial. Give this kind of a breakdown of it. You have your uh, center conductor. That's that copper wire in the middle. That is what is essentially transmitting it. <clears throat> then you have a dielectric core that surrounds it, kind of gives that cable strength. The beautiful thing is, is they put this braided shield around there, which makes it less um, susceptible to electromagnetic interference or EMI or RFI, which is radio frequency interference. So it is relatively resistant to it because of the way it's built. And then it has this jacket that slips over it. So for short distance in the house or in the office, there's two different kinds we use. Um, you have RG58, which is kind of like your old school cable hookup that you'd use for your TV. And then you would have your RG59, which is the newer version of it that would be used for networking and stuff like that. So there is a little bit of a difference. Now for long haul runs, that would be from like your cable provider, or your internet service provider, and all that stuff. They have what is called the RG6. It is a much thicker cable. And that would run from the from their bit, essentially their bat, their base or towers to you last mile, and then you would use the RG59 and RG58 inside the house. Do you need to know this? Yes, you do. What's the um, the symbol next to like the 75? Ohms. Again? Ohms, okay. You don't need to know that. <laughs> uh, so you don't need to know okay. the 75 ohms and all that for that's That's the level of resistance that the wires have when you're trying to push an electrical current through them. Um, so you don't need to really know that, but you do need to know when these wires are used. And so if you see RG59, you know that that is a coaxial cable. And then there's another way or another terms that they use to describe it that you need to know, but we'll get into that very soon. I have a question. Mm -hmm. How come they use ohms for like headphones? Because uh, like, you're still pushing it over copper wire, so resistance is still an issue. Oh, I always wonder that. It's like, how can they use, but I understand. So if, you're, if your amp can't push enough power to it, it won't be able to actually run the headphones. It's more of an issue like with uh, speakers and stuff like that when you're getting into 10s and 15s or 12s and 15s or whatever. And you have to have an amp to kind of boost that signal. All right. Two different types of connectors. We've already gone over this before. We have our old school 
BNC, which has the uh, little T posts that stick off of the cable as you push it in, you twist it and lock it. Um, and this is another term that they will use for the RGA, RG58, which is the 10 base two. This basically means it is a baseband communication. It can push 10 megabits per second. And two is the style that they're using. You will see this, this naming style used for almost all network communication. But just remember the first number here is your transmission speed. Base stands for baseband. And then the number on the end tells you the medium in which you're communicating. So that's how they kind of set it up. And then the common one that we're all used to, which is the F-type connector, which is the threaded screw that you would use on the back of your TV, your cable modem, or what have you. All right, you want more, you say. Okay, more cables. So now we get into our ethernet type cables. Yeah, that is true. And you have to remake your connector. Um, so now we get into the cable that we are most familiar with, or you know, the type of cable we're most familiar with, which is twisted pair or TP, twisted pair. And basically what that is, is it's eight modern ones or eight, the older ones are four, eight pairs of wires that are twisted together. Hence the name, twisted pair. And uh, they do this because if you run wires parallel to each other, the electrical current that's being pushed through the wires can actually jump from one wire to the other causing what's called crosstalk. So the reason they twist them together is no matter where the wires are making contact, they're at a right angle from each other. So they're not running parallel where it can jump from one wire to the other, they're at a right angle. So it's harder for the, for the, uh, the communications to jump from one cable to the next. And then they isolate them in pairs to make it a little bit easier. This particular type that we're looking at here is called a shielded twisted pair, and it's being used to kind of protect the wire from what's called EMI or electromagnetic interference, because that can disrupt the communications as it's moving through the wire. So it has this metal foil around the wires to kind of protect it from radio or electromagnetic waves to getting through it and disrupting your transmission. transmission. This little piece down here is just a strip of Kevlar and it's kind of used just to kind of give the wire strength. So don't worry about this extra piece here. Questions on this? More you say, okay. I love the excitement. All right, so now we can move on to UTP, which just like the previous one we had, it is a twisted pair. You can see the four sets of twisted wires, but it is unshielded. There is no metal foil protecting the wires. And uh, so it is very susceptible to electrical magnetic interference or radio interference, radio frequency interference. Why would somebody use this, you say? Because they are less expensive and easier to work with. So depending on the environment you are in, this may be perfectly acceptable. In your house, you, you likely have UTP or unshielded twisted pair. It is the more common one. In your server room, you likely will have uh, UTP or unshielded twisted pair. Easier to work with, easier to make cables, and less expensive. But same basic setup, four pairs, twisted wires. Older ones have two, but that's the old POTS lines or Plano Telephone Service.
still want more? All right, well, man, let's keep going. Here we go. So here are various categories of twisted pair cables. So you go back to the old Cat3. These would be the um, four pin POTS line early ethernet. And you see the fun naming um, system I was talking about. Where this is 10 base T. So 10 megabits per second. You see 10 megabits. 10 base band. T is the nomenclature they use for the Ethernet. Cat 4 jumped up to 16 megabits. And you see this common thread of 100 meters. So 16 megabits to cat four, cat fives where things started to get really nice, 100 megabits per second. Five E, we got one gigabit per second, which was awesome. Still kicking it around 100 meters. This is where things get a little bit weird. When you hit cat six, you can get 10 gigabits per second up to 55 meters. Beyond that, you can still go to 100, but you will only get one gigabit per second. Cat 6A solves this and you get 10 gigabits per second up to 100 meters. This is incorrect. So there is a drop off for speed on Cat 6 down to 55 meters. But beyond that, you can still go to 100, but you only get a one gig beyond that. Cat 7. The main difference with CAT7 is it is a shielded um, line. So that's the main difference between seven and six. It is a, basically the exact same as seven. It can go hundred meters, but it is a shielded line. And you said 6A um, solved the issue after 55 meters still? Correct. So it okay. can go up to 10 gigabits per second, up to 100 meters. Mm -hmm. Do you need to know this? Five and six you need to be aware of. Those are the main ones you need to know. So five, five E, six, and six A. And you need to know throughput and your distances. I wish I had a good acronym for you to remember it, but unfortunately this one is more brute force memorization. So flashcards helpful. Questions so far? More you say, okay, we'll keep going, it's fine. Twisted pair, we talked about this earlier um, on our cables and connectors. You have the two basic ones that you use. You have the squarish older POTS line right here with four pins, and that is your RJ11. They'll typically use two to four pins uh, used for old school telephone lines, ISDN, stuff like that. And you have the newer Ethernet cables uh, with eight pin connector, more rectangular in shape, more modern. Um, connector, and that is the RJ45. But, but what about those colors on the wires? Is that important to our life? Yes. Yes, it is. There are two standards we need to be aware of for wiring. T568B, T568A. 568B is the most common. If any of you have a network cable laying around, not the one that you're hooked up to on your computer right now, pick it up, take a look at it. Um, the way you're looking at it here, the tab is gonna be on the other side from what you're looking at. So we're looking at the underside of the cable. And there's two wiring standards we use. So the first one, 568B does orange stripe orange, Green stripe, blue, blue stripe, green, brown stripe, brown. Do we need to know this? Yes. 
how they remember this, they do have a little like poem thing. And it's, you know, for T568B, huh? Mnemonic device, not a poem. Eh, eh, it's whatever. Mnemonic device. Um, so <laughs> it's. Um, <laughs> yeah. Where's the, where's you have a, train, a trainer session? Yeah, I know. Well, she, she actually is a teacher. I'm not a teacher. So I get a lot of face palms as she walks through the room. Um, so the good stuff I do, she taught me everything. All right. So, um, <laughs> so for the T568B, is sun to the sky, brown to the ground, and the river runs on a sunny day. So you have sun to the sky, the orange up, brown on the bottom, and the blue run between the greens. So the, or excuse me, the river runs between the trees. Sun in the sky, brown to the ground, and the river runs between the trees, or runs through the valley. If you get tripped up on the striping versus solid, it always alternates. Stripe, solid, stripe, solid, stripe, solid, stripe, solid. All the way down. Always alternates. Sun in the sky, brown in the ground, and the river runs between the valley. Down on the bottom, this is D560AD, A, excuse me. Green stripe, green, orange stripe, blue, blue stripe, orange, brown stripe, brown. Trees to the sky, brown to the ground, and the river runs on a sunny day. If you notice, only two colors change. Blue is always the same. Brown is always the same. Green and orange are the only colors that switch. That's it. That would be a wonderful thing to put in the chat. Oh, the slides. I give them the slides. All right, so wiring standards. So wiring standards, here's the mnemonics for it. Trees to the sky, brown to the ground, river runs on a sunny day. Sun to the sky, brown to the ground, and the river runs between the valley. So this is just easy ways to kind of quickly remember it and look at it. The most common standard you will come across is B, T568B. So. Can you go back a slide for like a second? One second. Bang. Awesome. I got it actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sniffing tool was ready. It was ready to go. Anticipating me being, you know, smart ass. All right. Um, <laughs> Wait, I'm yes. sorry. Can you go back? I'm trying to screenshot it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yes, we do need to know this, and there's a couple of reasons why we need to know this. And that's when we get into cable types. Let me know when you're ready. Good to go. Cool. All right, so. We know our types. We know we know got to know. We, excuse me. We know we know we need to know the wiring pinouts for them. And we have one more twisted pair cable we need to be aware of, and it's called plenum. They love asking about plenum. I would guarantee you will have at least two to three questions on plenum cables. And why you will have two on this is because on your normal shielded and unshielded twisted pair cables. This sheathing is made out of PVC. It's polyvinyl chloride is what that stands for. Does anybody know what happens when you burn PVC? No. Toxic fumes? Toxic fumes. Toxic fumes. You get chloride gas, chlorine gas. Not very good for humans. So... I came up with a plenum cable, which has a fire resistant shielding on it and it shields each individual pair. So that's, that's kind of a nice bonus on it. So it is a shielded cable. Anytime we're gonna run cable through like a drop ceiling 
or through an HVAC unit or something like that, anywhere where air is going to be shared with humans, you typically are going to use a plenum cable because it is fire resistant. Like you can take a blowtorch to this thing, you'll barely get it to smolder. And so you won't have to worry about if like a, a wire catches fire or something like that, you get toxic fumes blown into the offices and stuff like that and people get sick and or worse. So plenum cable, fire resistant, drop ceilings or HVAC units. If you hear anything along these lines, plenum is your answer. Write it down, highlight it, put stars next to it. You're gonna see it a couple times on the test, I promise you. Questions? And this is a gimme. All right. More, you say. Moving away from twisted pair, moving into the more sophisticated fiber optic cables. So instead of copper wire, we now use light to transmit our data. Beautiful part about this, it is completely immune to electrical, electromagnetic or radio frequency interference. Completely immune to that. This is done by injecting either light, or by injecting light or, you know, with a laser or an LED to push it down a core, which will have a cladding over it to kind of help the laser be reflected down. You have a coating and a strength member to kind of give it a little more girth and so you don't break the inner core. And then you have an outer jacket to kind of protect everything. This allows us to carry data over much larger distances. Like we're twisted pair, we could get 100 meters. Out of fiber optic, we can get several miles. So for long distance transmission, high speed transmissions, this seems to be the way. We have two primary categories that we talk about when we're talking about fiber optic. So you have what is called MMF or multi-mode fiber. And this is where you're using different colors of light to transmit down the same line. It's very high speed, but at minimum to short distances. So over time, Colors can kind of blend, can cause issues in data. Now, for long hauls, we use what's called single mode fiber. Multi mode typically uses LED. Single mode fiber, high speed, very high speed, greater distances, much higher cost. And it typically uses a laser to push that information out. So, a much higher intensity light. I believe we have a visual to kind of show you how they work. Here we go. Um, so single mode. Hey, could you go back one slide really quickly, please? Yep. So Thank single you. mode versus multi-mode. Very good. So right here is kind of what it looks like. So you might have like a red, green, and blue light using to transmit three different data streams, and they would kind of bounce around through the line, which is why it can't go as far. <clears throat> single mode. Single light, single laser pushed all the way through. Um, originally, this could only be done in one direction, but now they've uh, used some creative physics to be able to push data down both directions, down single mode. Here's our naming and data that we need to know. So you have your multi-mode, there are three different kinds. You have your 100, 1000, and 10G base standards, FX, SX, and SR. And again, remember the number at the beginning tells you how fast it's transmitting. The number on the end will give you the standard. And you get two kilometers, two, 200 to 550 meters, and 300 meters at a multi-mode. Single mode, you get 1,000 and 10 gigabit versions, two kilometers and 10 kilometers. So long haul. 
Uh, easy to remember, L, long haul. And you have the S, short haul. And then the F, unfortunately, you have to remember, but it's fiber. Do we also use the repeater in the fiber optic? If you go beyond those distances, yes, you would need a repeater. So if I went beyond 10 kilometers with a single mode LR, then I would need a repeater to re-up the signal. So the, the distances that they have here are without a repeater. Give me another couple of seconds to grab that one. All right, Justin, I'm glad you asked. Yes, we have more. Um, so we can jump in now to our connectors. There are four basic fiber connectors that you need to be aware of. So we know the wires themselves. Now, how are we interfacing with our routers? So our basic connectors, there's four of them. So you have your ST, also known as straight tip. It uses that same BNC connector like the old coax. And <clears throat> it's kind of easy to identify. It has a round connector with the tip extruding from the end. This ST, straight tip. Below that, you have SC, which is square connector. You can see it has a very squarish shape on the end of it. That's SC. LC, otherwise known as the Lucient connector. Has a little kind of L shaped, you know, it's a little awkward, but it's a little L shaped tab on that connector. And it looks similar to the square connector, but it has the L in it. And then finally, the oddball in the group, MTRJ, which is two fiber strands in a single connector. See the little two right there, it's hard to see, but there are two little fibers on there. And this is a what's called a miniature form factor. So it's very small. And so it's kind of the oddball of the group, MTRJ. Two fiber lines, small form factor. Questions? So what's the difference between all these? It's basically manufacturer. So these were the various ones that came. This one was giving you dual, you know, basically you could have in and out in a single port, just miniature form factor, so it's much smaller. Um, but just depending on the type of lines you're using, you may have various connectors. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One second. Telephone tough guy. All right. Um, let me see here. All right. So fiber optic, really great problem being um, if the lines get broken. Uh, fiber optics tend to be very, very expensive to install. It's a very high speed connector. And I would say 20 years ago, if you broke a fiber optic line, actually, when I was studying civil engineering, when I first started, um, there was a construction project we were, we were on and they cut the fiber line. If you cut the fiber line, you will be fined. I think it's like a thousand dollars, depending on the line, it could be like a thousand dollars a minute until it's restored. So knowing that that's the case, how much would you be willing to pay a tech to get out there and fix it? Everything. Right? Basically, whatever they ask. Because I need you to drop whatever you're doing right now, get out here and fix this. And that was, that was like 20 years ago. 
And even to this day, fiber optic techs, you know, for jobs like this, charge tons of money. And people are willing to pay it because of things like this. So, because you can't just go, you know, put glue on it and go, and you're good. You know, it's not like a, a shielded, like a copper line where all you got to do is get the connectors right and you're good to go. No, you actually have to kind of like polish the, the glass. Then you get the connectors right. You have to use special kinds of glue. It is a um, acquired skill. Absolutely. So that being said, grab my randomizer here. Yo, Adebimpe, can you tell me what kind of connector are we looking at for number one? I miss her? Yep, there you go. Take a guess. I don't want to guess. I don't want to guess. You don't want to guess? I don't want to guess wrong. You don't want to guess wrong? We got to be comfortable getting things wrong. You know, it's going to happen. We're going to get things wrong. You might surprise yourself. It's two letters. It's got kind of a square um, shape. That's now J Getting some help in chat. Um, okay, SC. SC, square connector. Very good. All right, Anita, can you tell us what number two is? What type of connector are we looking at right here? Number two. Anita, number two down here, bottom right, or bottom left, excuse me. Oh, oh I don't see her. All right, grab another one here. Justin Wong, what are we looking at for number two? So RJ11. Nope, number two down here. Oh, coaxial. It is a coaxial cable. What type of connector are we looking at? The type type F. Mm, not quite. It has these little two posts sticking out that you would kind of connect to. It's kind of hard to see, I guess. B and C. B and C. So Good guess, so Justin. So type F would be the other coaxial, but you're right in the neighborhood on that one. All right, next, Tamika, can you please tell us what number three is? Not top center here, what type of connector are we looking at? RJ11. Absolutely is an RJ11. What's another name for that can we use? Bonus points. It's old. Pots. What do we call it? Pots. Pots. Plain old telephone service. Very good. Down here. Germanesh, can you please tell me what number four is? This is the bottom center one right here. Roundish connector. Has the uh, protruding fiber optic on it. Is that the SP? The S what? 
S-T. S-T. Very good. Straight, straight tip. Yeah, straight tip. Very good. So straight tip connector. Very good. All right. Number five. Mudasir. Please tell us what number five is right here on the upper right. Okay, it says IT in the chat. But, uh, I know the sixth one, but I'm not sure about the fifth one. No, no. I'm getting some help in chat. It's got a nice little L shaped oh, connector. Lucent connector. Lucient connector. Very good. LC, Lucient connector. Here you go. Does that have a cap on it? Or is that just how it That's is? the end of the of the fiber optic, actually. Oh, okay. Just the way the connector is set up. And then finally, number six goes to. Oh, not here. Jatoria. Can you please tell us what number six is? Bottom right. Okay, know. sorry, sorry. <laughs> it wouldn't, it wouldn't go come off mute. No worries. Uh, RJ forty five. Absolutely. How many pins does it have? Eight. Eight. RJ forty five. Also known as a twisted pair cable. Okay. Very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right. So. For those of you who really love the cables and connectors. It is my, uh, I hate to disappoint you, but I think that's the end of them, of course. They have one or two, maybe later, I'll try to find some for you, but that's all of them. So we gotta do a review on our tools right now. So networking cable tools that we might use on a day-to-day -day basis. First one being our rimper. So if we are making cables themselves, so making our own network cables, so to speak, in order to get the end piece onto the cable, we have to thread the little wires into this plastic connector. And then we use a crimper like this to clamp down on it. And what it does is there's little uh, copper pins or blades in there that pierce into the wires and connect to the copper of the wires that are in the twisted pair. So we have to untwist them, feed them in in the proper order, and then use a crimper like this to clamp down on them. And this one, it has like, it's a dual setup. So it has a RJ45 right here. It has an RJ11 right here, it has a built-in wire stripper, it's kind of an all-in-one tool. And this is how we would do the, the actual wires themselves. Now, next to it, we have the punch down tool. And this is how we would set up our ports, either in a punch down block, um, a patch panel, or in the uh, outlets in the wall. And this tool has kind of a U-shaped end to it. So it kind of has like a little bit of a U and then one side will have a blade and then the other side will be straight like this. So that's what the end of the tool will look like. And what will happen is, is one side will push the, the wire down into the block itself and then the other will cut the wire off flush. So you don't have little bits and pieces of wire hanging out of your connectors. So it makes it nice and neat. And it's called a punch down tool. So it's punching it down either into a 110 block, a patch panel, or a uh, outlet. And this is kind of what like an outlet would look like. You would set it up this way. Um, inside the outlet, as you can see right here, it would have a color pattern as to how you would lay out the wires. 
And then you would use the punch down tool right here, as you can see, right. to snap down into each place to push the wires mm -hmm. in and cut them off flush. Yep. I'm gonna take this blanket from you. You're gonna follow me over. So basic layout. You untwist the wires, place them in properly, punch them down, cut them off, and then the wires are flush on the um, outlet block. Other tools you will see, multimeter. We use this, you know, to see if we have what's called continuity. Basically, if I connect to one end to the other end of a wire, does the wire actually communicate? Uh, we can also use it to check voltages coming off of the power supplies to make sure that um, we're actually receiving the voltages that we're supposed to be receiving. If you remember, like doing the power supply tester um, lab in test out, this would be another way we could do it. We could use the multimeter to test the various pins and see if we're getting the proper voltages. Over here, we have the toner probe which you have the toner right here, which sends a musical tone down the line so that you can find the wire on the other end. So if I'm in a big office and they have a bunch of outlets and I wanna figure out which outlet is connected to which, which port on a patch panel, I could push, connect a uh, ethernet line to this toner and turn it on and it'll send a musical tone down the line. And then I would go to the patch panel and I would use this probe and touch each of the lines. And then when I hear the musical tone come out of the little speaker on it, I know I have the correct wire. And you can do this until the tone goes into a switch. The switch will eat the, the tone. So you typically would chase it to the patch panel. And then from there, you can work from inside the networking closet. Can anybody remember what the other name you will hear used for this particular device? Fox and Hound. Fox and Hound. Very good. So here's your Fox sending the line out and use the Hound to chase the line in the networking closet. So Fox and Hound. Two more pieces. This one here looks like a uh, ethernet cable that was clipped off and it kind of is. Um, what they did was they took two outgoing pins from your, your network card and then looped it back, which is why it's called a loopback plug and pushed it back into the incoming ports of your network card. And this tool serves one purpose, one purpose only. It is a troubleshooting tool. And all it's gonna do is verify if your network card is working. So I plug it in, I see the little lights bleeping on my NIC or on my network card. I know my network card is working. The troubleshooting tool has worked. So that's basically all it is. It's a, it's a troubleshooting tool. We have a software version of doing this called the loopback address, which we will get to soon where we send a ping to a 127.0.0.1 address, and that's our address. And what it does is it loops the signal back to us, but it's a way to do it software-wise versus using this hardware version of doing the same thing. But we'll talk about that tomorrow. And then we have our cable tester right here. So when we make cables, or if we have a suspicion that a cable is going bad, we can plug one end into this side and the other into this one. And this, these can separate so they can unclip and come apart. And they can be upwards of 100 meters apart because they're just sending signals down the line. And what it will do is it will send a pulse down each pin of the wire in sequence. So it'll send it down pin one, pin two, pin three, pin four, pin five, pin six, pin seven, pin eight, pin one, pin two, and it just cycles through it. So what you can look at is see when pin one pings, does it hit pin one on the other? Pin two pings, does it hit pin two on the other? Pin three pings and there's nothing on the other side. You know you've got a broken wire. So what this is doing is testing that each wire in your cable is still functioning properly. Very useful tool, thankfully extremely inexpensive.
You can pick one of these up for five bucks or something like that, maybe 10. So if you're making your own cables or whatnot, this is a great thing to have in your toolbox. You can test your cables right after you make them just to make sure that they're good before you put them in, in play. Questions on these two? All right. That's it for the tools. We have one last thing we need to get into, which is types of cables. Are there any original Xbox users out there? Any gamers that were actually playing on the original Xbox? I'm not going as far back as Nintendo, just the original Xbox. So we got one. Question for you, Jose. Do you remember if you wanted to hook up your Xbox to a friend's Xbox, you had to buy that special cable from the, 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 the Xbox cable or whatever to be able to hook two Xboxes together? No, because I thought it was, I thought the Xbox came with an Ethernet port. So I figured I would use It was that. an Ethernet port, but they had the Xbox cable that allowed you to hook, hook plug your, your Xbox directly into a buddy's Xbox. Oh, no, I never did plug. But yeah, I don't remember, to be honest. Yeah. I was going to say, was it the System Link cable? It's like something like that? Because I know they used to have like System Link lobbies and stuff, but. Yeah. So they had like a, they had a, they had a special cable. They sold it as the Xbox cable or whatever, or the System Link cable. And they charged you like 40 bucks for this cable. I mean, it was nice. It came with a nice black sheath on it. You know, it was, it was all of like two feet long. Um, should have been gold plated for the price. What that was was actually called a crossover cable. So pretty much anybody in IT or networking knew exactly what it was right off the bat. And so you remember we had the T568A and B, right? Now, if I have T568A on both connectors, both sides, that is what's called a straight through cable. So I would use this to connect from my, my computer to like a switch or a hub. Now, if I wanted to talk directly to another computer without using a hub, I can't use a straight through cable. Because what would happen is, is my outbound ports would be talking to their outbound ports. So it'd like me be trying, you know, trying to talk into a speaker and listen through a microphone wouldn't work, right? So what I have to do is flip the inbound and outbound. So I make what is called a crossover table. So I take the outbounds of one, which would be the greens, and then I would move them over to the inbounds of the other. So this is a crossover cable. I would have T568A on one side of the cable and T568B on the other side. So I would flip standards. And that allows me to have a direct communication without a switch or a hub between two computers. So if you're traveling on a, on a plane or something like that, and you want to link two laptops together, you can, if you have a crossover cable, just click, click, good to go. And these cables probably cost about $2, but Microsoft was marketing them as their own and charging people like 40 bucks a piece. Just something I distinctly remember. So you have a straight through cable and a crossover cable. So this problem has been corrected, but you needed to really pay attention to crossover and straight through cables. So just like if I wanted to connect two, like two computers together, I need a crossover cable. If I wanted to connect two switches together, I would need a crossover cable as well. If I plugged a straight through from one switch to another, you roll back the clock about 15 years or so, I could bring down an entire network by, do, by making that mistake. I plug it in, it creates a loop and it could bring an entire network to its knees. It's what used to happen. Now they have built in what's called uh, cable sense or auto sensing. So where they can sense what 
type of cable is in there and they can flip between a crossover and straight through. Makes it a lot easier. It's a lot less likely you'll make that mistake. But if you're dealing with older switches, this can happen. Um, so it is something that you want to be kind of careful of and make sure if you have a crossover cable that you mark it clearly. Put a little X on it, like, you know, use a piece of tape to create like a little tab on it. Put a little X for a crossover or something like that so you don't misuse it. Other things that you can do um, is you can create bottlenecks in your network. Remember how we go all the way back to um, the cable um, right here, where is it? Boom. So right here, you can create bottlenecks by using the wrong types of cables. So if I upgrade my entire, like all my switches and hubs and all that really awesome stuff, I update it to handle like 10 gigabits per second, but I start plugging in cat five wires, I'm not gonna get any better than 100 megabits per second. So your wire, your cables matter. The types of cable you're using, like we talked about HDMI, remember the cable type matters. You need to be able to look at the stats on the cable. The nice thing about a CAT6, or, or excuse me, the uh, network cables, is about every foot or so, I don't know if I can show it, probably not, you see text on there, right? That tells you exactly what type of cable it is. So if you have network cable laying around your house, pick it up, look at it, and see if you can tell what kind of cable it is. So like this particular one I'm looking at is a CAT5E. And it says UTP, which means unshielded twisted pair, right? So there is text about every you know, 12 inches or so on a cable that tells you exactly what kind of cable it is. And if I upgrade my network, but don't upgrade my cables, I can bottleneck my network, slow it down. And the problem also is everything has to talk at the same speed. So if I get a cat five cable mixed in with all my cat sixes and I plug it in, it can slow everything down. So, Moral of the story, if you upgrade your network and you go to a much faster high speed, get rid of all your old cables. Okay, use your upgraded stuff, get rid of the old stuff. I know, you know, we don't want to throw away cables because there may be someday, 20 years from now, where we desperately need that old Cat5 cable and we just want to hold on to it in case. But this is a case where if you keep those in your network closet, they may actually, somebody may just come in and grab one and use it and cause a lot of problems with your network. So cable types matter. Um, they get around this as- oh, I'm sorry. Ahead. I was ahead. just gonna ask, so what's the lowest, like the minimum at this point in time? What's the minimum you should have? Most networks are operating on six or six A at this point. Okay. So that should be like the, the bare minimum one you should have. I wouldn't say it's a bare minimum. You still have older networks that haven't upgraded that are operating on 5E because one gigabit per second is still pretty- you know, pretty handy on a network, but uh, a lot of places have upgraded to the six and six A because they've been out for a while. Okay. If you have a Cat five, not a five E, or a Cat four, or a three, goodness help you, just throw it away. Save yourself the heartache. All right. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, revelations. All right. Now we should be able to define net or you know different types of networks. Give examples of networks and topologies, physical topologies, geographic network types, and a few more cables and connectors, as well as network devices. And then we did a quick little review of a few network tools. And with that, after the long journey,